Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm not a lawyer, and I'm going to be talking about the challenges to women's political rights in the UN system, in legislatures, and how the legal profession can help. Um, as you are members of the United Nations Committee, uh, you're aware that the UN is essentially international policy based on law. It's a system of 260 treaties, conventions, agreements negotiated through the General Assembly conferences on a, on a wide range of issues, um, ranging from political security, economic, and social rights. Um, the UN also has a parallel interparliamentary system of almost over 70 organizations that are interparliamentary organizations linking elected legislatures to each other and to the UN. As all these agreements need to be ratified by legislatures and then implementing legislation needs to be passed by those parliaments um, in which, of course, your community is very actively involved. Um, in legislative politics, really, it is lawyers who are in charge. Um, a 2015 report on the U.S. Congress um, shows that 54% of senators are lawyers, and 36% of representatives ha also have had law degrees and uh, legal profession. And the same picture is there uh, globally. I'm originally from Pakistan, and in my country, not only are they lawyers, but they also are allowed to keep their private practices going. So several of them have actually used those law firms to protect each other and defend each other uh, when martial law imposed cases on them. Um, so there's a very sort of dynamic relationship between the lawyers' movements and the legislature across the world. Women, though, are the, the, the stats on women um, in Congress and in parliaments around the world are a little different. They tend to come to politics through the education and social service professions. Um, they're much more community focused. Uh, the issues that they have fought for when in the House um, tend to be focused on education, gender equality, reproductive health, economic parity. And unfortunately, these issues on an international level are not governed by treaty. Women are getting the policy, they're not getting the law. They are only governed by voluntary conference-based agreements. So whether one looks at the agreement of the Cairo conference, one looks at the platform from Beijing, one looks at any of these um, agreed by consensus, these are still principles and goals. The only exception was the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, referred to as CEDAW, which was an international treaty adopted by the UN in 1979. It was ratified by 189 countries, which is a huge majority of the UN. It has languished, though, as the United States, the most powerful member of the UN, refuses to ratify it. Um, and 26 of the ratified countries have serious reservations to CEDAW, particularly related to family-based matters. Um, new momentum, I want to look back a little into the past. The new momentum for gender equality really started in the work related to the Beijing Conference, the Fourth World Conference on Women, in 1995, where a global consensus was achieved on the principles of a woman's empowerment, her political rights, her reproductive health rights, her economic rights, her rights to be secure, essentially saying that women's rights were human rights. Uh, Hillary Clinton was one who said it, but it was really the, the, uh, the conference itself which spoke very strongly in the Beijing platform on that. Um, <clears throat> this work was started actually by a very feisty New York lawyer who was also a congresswoman, the late Bella Abzug. Um, and I had the honor of working with her. She was the instrumental leader who started an international coalition for the women's movement, which until then had been very much a sort of Western feminist revolution. Bella persuaded governments that a daily meeting of what she called the Women's Caucus was an essential tool for getting consensus on all conference issues. I joined her in 92, and when I joined Parliamentarians for Global Action in 93, we, came, we did an agreement that for every meeting that they would do, we would add women legislators to that meeting at the UN. 
um, and that those women legislators, in addition to attending the Women's Caucus, would also be members of the official delegations on behalf of their governments, so that they could take the word that women were agreeing to the table. The Women's Caucus became a permanent institution at every UN conference. It is still today. With daily briefings, analysis of the conference language, clause by clause negotiations, that is how we worked on the abortion consensus in Cairo. It is now being a key tool to get consensus from both men and women on every treaty, convention, and agreement, the International Criminal Court, the Arms Trade Treaty, and the latest Sustainable Development Goals. If you Google it, you will see there's a woman's caucus or a woman's group related to each of these, which has been really instrumental in getting agreements. The interesting corollary was going on at the political level through negotiating for their equality goals at in through these conferences, particularly Beijing, women activists started to run for national office. Um, at the time when Beijing took place, it was about 10 to possibly 11% women across the globe who were members um, of elected parliaments. The progress has still been very slow. 20 years later, the numbers still stand at only 22.6 in national legislatures. Women speakers are now 17.8%, women ministers, 17.7%, um, only 6.6% of all heads of state and 7.3% of all heads of government. Some countries, there's even been some regression. Um, the world's largest democracy, India, the numbers have gone down to 12% because there isn't a quota. Um, there has been an attempt in the UN system to say, how can we sort of make this entrenched inequality budge? Um, and UN Women has launched its iconic campaign called He for She, which has a hashtag and Emma Watson as its speaker. <clears throat> it is calling for men to be real partners in gender equality, and I'm glad to see some men here. Um, however, in, in the political world, Unfortunately, power and visibility are a zero-sum game. There can be only one Speaker of the House, only one Chair of a Committee, only one Secretary General, only one President, only one Prime Minister. So positions are heavily fought for, and women have to play very tough to get them. Um, even within organizations, I organized the Beijing Conference's parliamentary meeting. And after having done all the organization, my boss decided that he wanted to go instead of me. And I had to go over and above him, around him, to get him to overturn his decision. Um, it was something I had to really fight for. Uh, and I was surprised to even be facing that at the end of six months of work on something that was my project. Leadership jobs are also 24-7, particularly political jobs. They take their toll on family life. At Beijing Plus Five in the year 2000, we decided to do something different. Um, we asked the women legislators who came for a meeting here at the UN that we organized of 200 women legislators to share their challenges after having been elected, both in parliament um, and at home. It was a very sobering report. More than a quarter of their marriages had collapsed, and many were planning to quit after their first term. The male political spouse has still to join he for she. Now, we will see something interesting in the US in case um, Mrs. Clinton gets the Democratic nomination, where we will see a very powerful uh, former president as the, as the spouse. Um, but it will be really interesting to see how he makes that transition to becoming the he for she. Um, one effective tool at the legislative level has been a cross-party, well-staffed women's caucus. Lawyers' role in drafting legislation is crucial for women's caucus members because most women, when they enter the legislature, often tend to be the most junior members with the least amount of parliamentary staff. There are about 88 such cross-party, cross-issue caucuses across parliaments, and they are producing some results. In Pakistan, the first woman speaker, Femida Mirza, was the one who formed the Women's Caucus, which passed more laws on women's empowerment than any prior legislature. However, many of those laws lapsed 
in the next legislature because the elections move towards the conservative right. And several of those women who had championed those laws brought them into the lower house. Both the lower and the upper house have to pass the law for it to become permanent law. Several of those laws have lapsed. In Kenya, attorneys work very intensively with the Kenyan Women's Parliamentary Association, Kewopa. Equal property rights, equal citizenship rights, two-thirds either gender rule in government bodies, even, um, according to the chair, Cecilia Mbarere, even our right to wear trousers in parliament is the result of the work that they have done, that attorneys have done with Kewopa. However, despite all that effort in Kenya's parliament, it's still only 19% women. And this is despite the fact that political parties have nominated women to the nominated seats to try and add uh, to the number. Um, the European Union and the European Parliament have a pretty solid record in the area of gender equality. And part of it is, I think, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but you guys are, um, that their system of law is a statutory system of law, which allows for much more prescriptive legislation, I understand. Um, they have also mandatory national equality bodies, and in 2006 created a network of gender equality bodies um, to enforce implementation of the laws that they pass. The political party list system, which is there in most European countries, also makes it easier to get more women into parliament because essentially the party list is made by party bosses and they can be persuaded to both give a number quota as well as to ensure that women are not at the bottom of the list. Um, <clears throat> it's much harder in the US where the election is both an individual-based effort on campaign and where the campaign finance requirements are very high. However, the Women's Caucus still keeps trying. Um, Rep. Carolyn Maloney, who led the US delegation to Beijing and is a leading member of the US Congressional Women's Caucus, introduces a bill every year for the Equal Rights Amendment and for ratification of CEDAW. But the caucus lacks both numbers and power to pull through. Women in Congress are still only 20%. And here, really, um, the New York Bar and the American Bar Association can do a lot <clears throat> to add to both advocacy um, and um, assistance to legislators in this country to pull through on this. <clears throat> I realize that making gender equality legally binding across national institutions and the economy are very hard. However, bright lawyers are capable of coming up with solutions everywhere. And I'm sure that when you put your mind to it, there are examples of things that can be done which are effective. Um, I've been working a little bit in the UK lately, and one of the things that's a very interesting law that has just been introduced by their Women and Equalities Minister is going to be an enforcement of publication by 2018 of the gender pay gap by companies with more than 250 employees. And this is going to include not only salary, it also has to include bonuses, and it also has to include numbers in each position of how many men and how many women are being paid what. Um, this is going to really be a game changer in, in this area of the gender pay gap. Now, um, the, the area where I feel not enough has been done, and it's there in the gender equality goals, is this issue of accounting for the unpaid care given by women um, in the home to family members, children, and the elderly. And just to give you a sort of, and this is one of the targets that is there, but to give you a sense of what this is, um, the gender pay gap is linked to this. The gender pay gap worldwide is on average 24% between men and women. In high-income countries over their lifetimes, women in Sweden and France earn 31% less than men. The figure is 49% in Germany and 75% in Turkey. These gaps are there because employers are 
tacitly assuming that the woman is going to take time out when she has children, she is going to need more flexibility, she is not going to stay for the 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. meeting, she is going to take care of the elderly, and so they are sort of almost gaming this by giving them less money. Um, so this whole area can change once you have laws that require their unpaid labor to be recognized and monetized. At this point, the only country doing that is Norway. Uh, every 10 years in the census, they require that individuals fill out uh, the amount of time that they spend in care work. Um, and it is beginning to change the dynamic of the care work as well. Um, Australia is beginning to figure out how they're going to do this. They're going to be using opportunity cost. And it's interesting to me also what happens when leadership shows up. You know, in terms of international institutions, very few major institutions have women at the top. But when they do, things begin to change because a new normal starts to take place. When I was made Secretary General of PGA, it was an Affirmative Action Act in 1996. One of the first things I did was to change our staffing to be 40-60 either gender. Two years after being appointed, I persuaded the board to change their own election rules to become 40-60 either gender. And today, you know, 20 years later, it's those rules are still there. That has become normal. Um, the IMF has recently appointed a woman as executive director. For the first time, the IMF is beginning to talk about the hidden GDP of the world, which is the unpaid care work done by women. And it adds anywhere from 25 to 50% to the GDP if you are applying it either at opportunity cost or at um, minimum wage. So one of the most exciting things that's going to take place this year, and I'd be happy to answer questions later, is that the UN itself is going to be electing a new Secretary General. And there are several of us, I'm part of a campaign called Woman SG, who are asking governments that this time we want it to be a woman. And here is something that actually all of you can do. Um, you know, there are five countries, the permanent five of the Security Council, who will be making this decision on a joint basis. The United States is the most powerful of them. It's often called P1. The president is a lawyer. So as lawyers, you should write to him and ask him to uphold the principles of gender equality and affirmative action. After eight men, it's time for a woman. Thank you. Thank you.